Welcome to the eighth, I can't believe I'm saying that, the eighth annual Moyad Shoals Spring Conference, which is now twice the size uh, from previous years. And so we've added just all-star speakers. And one of the ones that I've been trying to add for a good eight years, but we can never flag this person down, uh, is Dr. Matthew Cooperberg at UCSF. And I'll just tell you a quick story that he gets the gold award. I mean, I know in AUA, you got the golden cystoscope award, but this is like the gold, I don't know what I call it, the gold uh, doctor award of the year. And the reason he does is he had no idea that he was one of our primary targets for this conference. So then I was in Utah at a prostate conference a few weeks before, <laughs> before actually we're going to air this. And I said, I didn't say hi to him, even though I haven't seen him in five years. I just said, hey, can you do this? And he said, yes, I will definitely do this conference. So I will just tell you, Dr. Matthew Cooperberg at UCSF, professor of urology and also epidemiology and biostatistics. I caught him in Utah and he's agreed to do it. He was very sweet. And I think I call him the man, the myth, the legend. And he's the man, the myth, the legend to me because he's not only a urologic surgeon, but he's a professor in epidemiology and biostatistics, and my background is in public health. So there's very few people that know statistics and epidemiology as MDs, and especially as urologists. So he holds a special place in my heart. Plus, we were on the circuit together. You remember all those years we were on the Absolutely. circuit? Absolutely. And Absolutely. what you see is what you get. He was one of the nicest guys I had met out there. And so that's why I call him the man myth and the legend. I call him Mr. Public Health, right? So I thought. Matthew, I thought, you know, I think you're also chair at the VA there in San Francisco, aren't you? Yeah, service chief. Yeah, service chief. I know, but you but you have a million different hats. But I thought you have one of the best websites I've ever seen. It's a massive picture of you. This is the new UCSFHealth.org redesign. No, everybody's doing it. Trust me. Big. Trust me. Everybody's doing this. You're larger than life. Yeah. But to me, you are larger than life. And it says urologic cancer surgeon, husband, father, runner. As long as I've known you, you've been a runner. Uh, skier, which I just saw you in Utah. Music lover. I don't know what kind of music. Do you have a, do you have a certain kind of music you like or do you play? Uh, mostly alternative. I love, love going to concerts. It's great to see them happening again in person. Yeah. It's great. So if you could go to one concert this year, which one would you go to? Oh, that's a good question. I went to the first one I got to after lockdown was uh, Weezer Fall Out Boy and Green Day playing at the uh, at the stadium here in the city. It was it was fantastic. Really? Was fantastic. Pearl okay. Jam is coming to Oakland next month. I'm going to try to hit that, although it might be during the AUA. So, well, and then it says hiker and traveler. So that's awesome. And you know, <laughs> I'm going to put this away for a second. So I have a series of surprise questions for my speakers. I decided to skip the first one and move them to the end. But before we get going on talking about active surveillance, I'm going to expand our discussion today. And for those of you, this is the same as with Dr. Vogelzang and Dr. Eugene Kwan. Uh, Matthew Cooperberg can tell you that when we go to medical meetings, I call this, it's not a really nice name. It's a crude name. I call it death by slides. There's so many slides, you almost become overwhelmed and you fall asleep. But what a lot of the speakers don't get an opportunity to do is just kind of talk off the cuff with someone who's interviewing them. So I get to talk to all these guys and gals, you know, off hours, and they have such dynamic personalities, and they're so passionate about what they do. I always say to myself, I'd rather just, I wish they could just hear one of the recordings on the telephone or in person, and we would just get rid of these slides. So we decided again, this is my fault, not Matt Cooperberg's fault. I said no slides unless you want to make a certain point, and then maybe you'll show some slides at the end. And let's just see where this goes, right? So here's my curiosity question for Dr. Cooperberg. <laughs> I went back through your past and I don't, I know you've never been asked this question. It says, how many times do you get a pro, and you have to explain this to the audience. How many times do you get a prostate or dermatology question when you and your wife are out to dinner with friends? Always, <laughs> sometimes, or never? Will you explain that question? Because if you were, if I was living near you, you and your wife would never get a word in edgewise. You'd oh be looking God. at all my moles. You'd be checking my <laughs> prostate. So can you answer that? Could, can you ever go out to dinner without people asking you medical questions? Yeah, my wife. So my wife 
Jacqueline Delev. We were in med school together. She trained out here at UCSF with me. Um, people are much more upfront about asking her questions at dinner with me. It usually either takes a few drinks, so they try to keep me, catch me in the bathroom, or uh, you know, it's always a question about their friend. So you know. <laughs> Yeah. So, so do you get uh, that? Where you get that like from Seinfeld and places. Hey, look at, can you see this mole? Do you get that? Do you get exactly, that at the table? Exactly. I mean, I I've heard of a lot of uh, dynamic duos for doctors, but I don't remember the last time I've heard a urologist and a dermatologist. So there's a so, few, when I was a resident, it seemed like all the urology residents at Stanford down the road were, were dating or married to dermatologists actually. Really? Yeah. So would the answer be always, sometimes, or never? Uh, um, frequently. <laughs> knew it. Have a high, a high, a high sometimes. High sometimes. And man, I knew it. All right. That's fabulous. This is how we're going to do it today. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to say one more compliment. And this sounds like I'm being obsequious, but I'm not. You, The one place you nauseate me the most, <laughs> honest to God, is I've been on the, I used to be on the circuit with you going back 15, 20 years ago. And I, people say this, and I'm just telling you, of all the speakers I can think of over the past 20 years, I swear that you still look the same as the day we were speaking 15, 20 years ago. I am absolutely convinced you bathe in formaldehyde. There's more gray in here, but I would say the same to you. So uh, No, I appreciate, I appreciate that, but I think, I don't know if it's the running. Or I think it's the running. I, I'll, I'll say the running. Yeah, I, that to me, it's been the running too. Okay. We got through all my fun stuff. Now, here's how we're going to do it today. You're, you're listed as the active surveillance guy, but you're also a surgeon. So I want to cover some topics around it, then just talk about active surveillance. And the first thing I want to talk about is screening. Yep. And I wasn't going to talk about screening until this week. And the reason is, is that in the JAMA Network Open, there was a paper called Trends and Incidents of Metastatic Prostate Cancer in the United States. It just came out actually on March 14th. And here's the crux of it. And you can comment on it or not. And But I just want you to talk about screening for a moment. It says essentially that uh, metastatic prostate cancer has increased significantly corresponding with the idea that you didn't have to screen going back many years. And so one of the consequences potentially of telling men that they don't have to be screened for prostate cancer is now that they're seeing in their latest data, this is the SEER database, which is a well-known database, mm -hmm. they're showing an increased risk of being diagnosed with metastatic prostate mm -hmm. cancer. Yeah, this is this is a true phenomenon. This is There's been a few papers actually now out on this topic in the last couple of years, all of which shown all of which have shown this exact same phenomenon. Um, and what's interesting, and, and honestly a bit of a challenge is teasing out the reason for it or the reasons for it, because it probably is multifactorial. Um, most of the papers that have been looking at this show this trend starting almost 10 years ago. Now the, the mortality curve starts going up. Um, having, and it's a curve that had been going down for 20 years previously. If you think about the the trends uh, for prostate cancer compared to other cancers over the last 25 years at from the start of the PSA era around 1990 to about four or five years ago, prostate cancer mortality rates were falling and falling and falling and falling, honestly, steeper than any other cancer except lung cancer. Mm. Um, and the reasons for this, again, are probably multifactorial, but there have been some very good modeling analyses by Ruth Etzioni's group at CISNET and others suggesting that at least half of this, and probably more, is more or less directly attributable to the benefits of screening and early detection and early treatment of aggressive prostate cancer. And then that curve kind of flattened out, and now it appears to be rising. Now, the when you think about the history, you just referred to the history of screening in, in the last decade. In 2008, we got this I recommendation indeterminate from the US Preventive Services Task Force, meaning they couldn't really recommend or not. They said, don't screen older men at that time. Then in 2012, they said, don't screen anybody ever. Um, and they kept pointing to this explanatory text and all these caveats. But the reality is a lot of primary docs interpreted that exactly that way, which is don't screen for prostate cancer. Screening rates and diagnosis rates fell about 25% across the board in a matter of months around 2012. Then 2018, we got this slightly more nuanced recommendation from them, um, you know, it's a C recommendation, which means in their view, the harms tend to outweigh the benefits, but you should have a shared decision-making conversation between the primary doc and the patient about whether or not to go down the PSA screening pathway. And now screening rates are going up again and diagnosis rates are going up again a little bit. 
Um, what's interesting about the rise in the mortality rates is that it was starting around 2012, 2013, mm. which is a little bit early uh, because it takes years. Even if you've got a high risk prostate cancer, there's at least a five year lag typically between diagnosis and when you might actually die of it, even for the bad ones. So it's a little bit, it would be a little too soon to say, well, the rates fell in 2012 and you know, by 2013, we're seeing the mortality increase because we stopped screening. So a lot of us think it's actually two phenomena. You know, the, the drop in screening has exacerbated what was already starting to happen as a trend for increasing mortality. Now, why that was happening, we don't necessarily know. It's probably got at least something to do with the aging population, the fact that men are dying less often of early cardiac disease because we're treating early cardiac disease more, you know, more yeah. aggressively. So they're living longer. You know, you, most men that die of prostate cancer have lived, you know, made it to their 70s and 80s or, or older. So that's it's probably one factor. And then the drop in screening rates is, is making it worse. Well, what was your going? I don't even remember. I mean, I remember seeing you on the circuit, but what was your opinion when the when the task force said, "Look, I don't, I'm not so sure you should be screening anymore." I mean, because yeah. because it seemed like there were urologists. Some of them just lost their minds about that. <laughs> other ones seemed yeah. to not care as much, and other people a actually agreed. So, where were you on that fence? Because I don't remember. Yeah, I they got it really, really badly wrong in 2012, and um, they. You know, first of all, there's there are some nuances in the way they set up the screening recommendation, the way they choose the methodology that kind of guaranteed they were going to get this result. Uh, the way they choose to consider some trials, ignore other trials, ignore everything that it is not a trial. So they they sort of set themselves up to come up with this recommendation. Um, and you know, the the person who ran the task force uh, definitely had a, a goal in mind and coming out with that, with the D recommendation, um, I think is a fair statement um, in, in 2012. So, you know, it was, they, they cherry picked the literature to make things look as bad as possible for screening. And I, I think that's a pretty fair statement, quite honestly. Uh, however, the reason they did it, or at least one of the main reasons they did it is our fault in the treating community, urology, radiation oncology and others, because for you know, decades leading up to 2012, basically from the start of the PSA era to you know, the early 2010s, we were over-treating every single prostate cancer we found. You know, if you think about the whole point of prostate cancer screening is not to find prostate cancer. If you live long enough, every man is gonna grow a couple of cancer cells in the prostate. We know from these autopsy studies, you make it to 60, it's already about 50% of men have a couple of cancer cells in there. It's 30% of men in their 30s. Uh, mm -hmm. You live, you get old enough, everybody's got some cancer in the prostate. And most of this makes absolutely no difference, causes no symptoms, causes no threat to life. I am in a growing vocal minority of people that think we shouldn't even use the word cancer for some of these things mm -hmm. because they have basically no capacity to spread or cause any harm. Mm -hmm. um, but because we put that C word out there, um, the knee jerk reaction is, well, it's a cancer, we've got to treat it. So if you look at what happened with active surveillance, which is you know, watching the low risk cancers, um, even for low risk disease, which basically never spreads, we were only using surveillance for about 10% of those patients, year in, year out, up until the task force. And that, you know, the 2012 statement, as much as it was a, a you know, a lot of us would say a pretty bad uh, guideline, it was a wake up call and, and a kick in the pants for urology. And we have now really moved the needle on surveillance. We're now up to about 60% across the country, which is in 60% in of men with low risk disease getting active surveillance, which is closer to where we need to be. It's 80% of the VA system. It's 80% in Sweden. Wow. You know, that's probably about the right target. It's around yeah. 80%. It's never gonna be hundred percent, but that's probably where we need to get to. Just to emphasize that point, the most updated data that we have come from a registry called Aqua, which the American Neurological Association um, has been running since 2012. I've been involved with this from, from the beginning, and it's it allows us to track what's happening at now 250 urology practices across the country. It's almost a quarter of all the urologists in the country that are participating. One of the things we've been looking at is the use of active surveillance for low risk disease. And these are data which are going to be presented at the AUA in a couple months. Um, and you can see ongoing progress here. Again, in the early 2010s, we were only around a quarter, uh, now up to about 60% of men with low risk disease who are actually getting active surveillance as opposed to treatment.
However, we also know that there is still a huge amount of variation. And what this graph shows here, um, it's you know, confusing because it shows the reality, which is um, the likelihood of active surveillance, depending on which urology practice the patient is seen at and which individual urology provider the patient is seen at. So depending on which door you happen to knock on, your likelihood of getting active surveillance by urology practice ranges from zero to about 85, 90%, depending on whose door you knock on within the practice, which urologist ranges from 0% to 100%. And this wow. is obviously a problem. This is by no means unique in active surveillance or in prostate cancer or in urology. We use this term small area variations, and this applies everywhere in healthcare where we have had the courage to pick up the rock and look under it. Um, but we know that we need to you know, get at this problem of variation. Um, and, and using registries and exposing docs to their own practice patterns and outcomes is a first step down that road. No, that's well put. And I'm going to say it with my, I'm going to throw my voice, my ventriloquist voice. When in doubt, get a second opinion. Sorry, I had to throw that in. <laughs> right? Do you, do you, Always good advice. I always want to blame you. And I just keep on the screening topic for a second, because huh? this is how you summarized PSA. You said... PSA is one of the best cancer markers ever studied. We just haven't used it properly. We've overscreened old and frail men. We've underscreened young and healthy men, overtreated low risk prostate cancer and undertreated high risk prostate cancer. And PSA does not have a threshold. It's not four. Right. Can, you, can you comment on that? Why is it? So is, are we just getting rid of the idea of four? Four is just, even though it still shows up on some lab reports as four is the threshold, because it does. Are we? Are you saying get rid of that whole four is bad? Four is bad. Four four is over. Uh, and the reason the reason first of all you have to understand the reason that four kind of got out there in the first place. Um, the reason four wound up being the threshold is that when PSA was developed as a screening tool, it was mostly tested in men in their late sixties and early seventies, and that unfortunately is still the most common age for a man to get a PSA test in in this country is in his late sixties or early seventies. And the problem there is that PSA is prostate specific antigen. It is not prostate cancer specific antigen and mm -hmm. anything else that happens to the prostate can affect the PSA. And as men get older, most men develop some degree of BPH, benign prostate hyperplasia, just growth of the prostate. And that makes the PSA drift up over time in the population as a whole. So when you look at PSA in a population in, in their late sixties and early seventies, you're gonna see higher PSAs. And if you're trying to separate out the noise the signal from the noise, there's a lot of noise in the background there. Now, if you look at PSA in younger men, men in their late 40s, early 50s, you know, even up to early 60s, there's much less BPH. Uh, so there's much less noise, you know, much less mud in the water is maybe another analogy for it. So the PSA becomes a much more reliable marker of prostate cancer in younger men, but with a much lower threshold. Um, this actually is maybe worth showing as a, as a slide here. Um, there's a beautiful study that they that was done out of uh, Malmo, Sweden. You know, one of the lines is everybody in epidemiology wants to be an epidemiologist in Sweden because you know nobody ever moves. They track every heartbeat from birth to death, and they have these incredible record systems. And they do things like in 1982, round up the entire city population of Malmo, draw yeah. blood on them, and stick it in the freezer. And yeah. everybody kind of lives out their lives. This is years before PSA was on anybody's uh, radar. And they went back later. This was Hans Lilia, who's clinical chemist at, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and Andrew Vickers, who's a statistician there, were able to run PSA tests on these 20-year-old specimens sitting in the freezer and match it with all the vital records that they collected in, in Malmo and figure out what had happened. And it's a beautiful study because this is completely absent any secular PSA testing. There was no PSA available throughout the lives of most of the men studied here. So as it happens, about 3% of the men got prostate cancer, about 0.5 or 6% of them died of it, which is a lot like the, the rates that you see uh, in the States. Huh. And, and this is what they found in, in a series of papers here. So if your PSA was under one at age 60, you're pretty much done. Your likelihood of ever dying of prostate cancer fell to you know 0.3%, incredibly low. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of the deaths happened in men with a PSA over two. That defined the top quartile, the 75th percentile. Um, but the follow-on paper looked at even younger men. So this was looking at men in their late 40s at time of uh, at the time of the PSA test. And what you see here, and first of all, 
one of the things I like about this graph is it emphasizes just how long you need to follow men to see the value of screening. So, you know, part of the problem with the task force guideline in 2012 is the trials were not really mature and all they had was 11 year outcomes to focus on. Well, at 11 years, you can see here, nobody's dying of prostate cancer no matter what your PSA is because it grows much too slowly. So there's not even enough events to make any comment. 15 years, you're barely getting adequate. This is where you see the differences, 20, 25 years down the road, which is why we really need to think about younger men when we think about who is the best to screen. Um, and the, the, you know, the numbers here uh, really show you. So the top quartile is defined by a PSA of 1.1, the yeah. top 10 percentile by 1.6. And this is where all the deaths are happening. These are the, the mortality rates here. Uh, the median, okay, the median across the population is around 0 0.7. And there've been a bunch of follow-up studies since. This is um, looking at a number of different cohorts, including the Malmo cohort. Um, but this includes a couple of cohorts of heavily African-American men in the Southeast, um, it includes the Harvard Professional Follow-Up Study and a few others, um, and very, very consistently. You can see here the, the median across the population consistently across these studies is around 0.7 for men in their 40s. You get to 0.8 for men in their 50s, approaching 1.0 by the time you get to 60. And, you know, and the 75th percentile is only a little bit higher than that. So you can pretty much wipe out 75% of the population in terms of their risk of having a clinically significant, potentially lethal prostate cancer by screening men you know, in their 40s or 50s with a threshold of 1.0. Uh, and you can do that with a pretty minimal shared decision conversation. So are you suggesting then anyone who turns 40 as a man should just get a baseline PSA and see if they fit that criteria you just showed? Absolutely. Really? Absolutely. Maybe not 40, we don't have data at 40, but 45, somewhere between 45 and 50. I find Absolutely. it interesting that nobody balked at all when the colorectal folks decided to bring screening down to 45. Yeah. And you yeah. know, I know they have some data, but at the same time, you know, it's not easy to get a colorectal cancer screen. You know, some of us don't like it, but the reality is, you know, we've moved that line to 45. So you're saying going forward, ideally in the Cooperberg world, 45 is a good age to get your first PSA. Absolutely, because the other the other piece of this is that PSA is by no means the end of the story. So this has also been a big evolution in the last few years is, you know, thinking about PSA, PSA is clearly not a diagnostic test, but the old paradigm used to be, well, if you had a high PSA, you go on to get a biopsy. Now we've got all these secondary biomarkers. We've got urine tests, we've got blood tests, we've got MRI. Yeah. So the concept, and we've actually managed to program this into the primary care pathway at UCSF, which was not a small victory after a two-year conversation with primary care leadership. It was a great, you know, it was wow. really a great engagement. Uh, this is now baked into our, these kinds of low thresholds are baked into our record system, our EMR system. Uh, but when we see a patient with a mildly elevated PSA or even a significantly elevated PSA, we do not rush into biopsy, everybody. Um, we do these secondary tests first. So yeah. again, there's urine tests like XODX and select NBX. There's blood tests like 4K and yeah. there's MRI. And we use these very heavily now for men who have an elevated PSA to make the decision to we then go on to biopsy. Because these other tests, the ones I'm talking about here, are much more specific for high grade clinically significant disease. Because that's what we're trying to find. We don't really want to find the low grade. We right. want to find the, the higher grade ones. The the meeting you just referred to where David Crawford said, you know, active surveillance is actually terrible. We shouldn't be finding these things in the first place. And I saw you. Shudder. He wasn't wrong about that. Right. The, the best thing to do with low risk disease is not find it. Yeah. You know, it's funny because when he when we're talking about the meeting we were at, I, there is that feeling, too. You know, everybody's everybody's praising active surveillance. But ideally, I would rather just have nobody on surveillance, either they're diagnosed and treated or not. Right. As opposed to having to be told they have the C word, but I mean, <clears throat> I'm glad you didn't take offense at that because there's that makes sense. But you still say, as we still talk about screening, look, we've still driven down prostate cancer mortality despite all these dumb moves yep. in the past by over 50%. Imagine if we use PSA itself more intelligently. Yeah. Right. That's so, exactly right. but you know what? The reason I bring this up with screening too is because here's a question that only you can answer on that, this certain part, because I had a patented answer for 25 years at Michigan. And that is, or anybody that calls, that is, okay, I have a family history and we'll talk more about that when we talk about active surveillance. I want to talk to my sons. I have to tell my son something. And I always would say, yeah, I'll tell you what you tell your sons. 
You tell them to do everything possible to reduce their cardiovascular risk to as close to zero as possible. And then that takes care of everything else from head to toe. What I wasn't confident to talk to them about is when it came to PSA screening and what else they should do. So, okay, someone asks you, I have, a, I have some sons. I want to talk to them about when I should get, they should get their first baseline PSA. You said 45. Does that mean everybody or are you willing to push that back even further for someone that convinces you they have a family history? Yeah. So first of all, you know, I've stolen that line from you from, uh, from the times we were lecturing together all those years ago. And I use it all the time in, in the office. If I would have um, had it, man, I'd be the richest person in medicine. <laughs> no, I mean, I honestly, and, and you know, it's a bit of a side note, but the, the whole concept of the teachable moment at the cancer diagnosis is one that we, you know, at the whole group of us at UCSF have always taken very seriously. We've been doing diet and lifestyle intervention work forever here with June Chan and Stacey Kenfield. And there's no question you know, I can think about some guys specifically who, you know, we saved their life, not by diagnosing the cancer, but because by getting into healthcare for the first time in 20 years, you know, you start having the conversation about the smoking and the diet and the, and the obesity. Uh, and they come back next year, you know, on active surveillance, 30 pounds lighter and, you know, much more active and, you know, and, it, and it's, it's, it's really gratifying. So, you know, and, and we, we really try not, not to miss the forest for the trees, but yeah. getting back to your question, yeah, um, you know, the, it's, it's a little bit tricky because typically it's not me having this conversation, right? It's usually primary care. And, you know, every time I give a talk like this to a primary care audience, you know, one of the comments is always that the guidelines are too complicated and the screening protocols are too, too complicated and you need to keep it simple. And for the concept of keeping it simple, 45 makes a lot of sense to me as a start age, partly because men are rarely even seeing their primary care providers um, in their 40s, certainly not much before that. And because we really have very few data below 45. Um, you know, having said that, men with family history, and when I say that, I mean strong family history. Everybody's got an uncle or a grandfather or a cousin who had low risk disease and didn't get treated. But somebody who has, you know, their father, their brother, their grandfather all had it. Their father actually died of it at a young age. Um, you know, real family history, or they've had genetic testing and they actually have a mutation in BRCA2 or one of these other related genes, um, then we should really think about earlier screening. And the same applies maybe to other high-risk groups like African-American men. Um, that's a little bit controversial. I think when you see a, a combination of factors, you know, African-American men with a family history, then um, you know, some of the guidances from the American Cancer Society, for example, will push it back to 40. And I've, there are some families where, you know, somebody died of prostate cancer really early where I, I have recommended a test at 30. Um, I have a 42 year old in my practice who had lymph node mets at, at um, a time of surgery at 42 years old, you know, this is bad genetics. And, you know, when that yeah. sort of predisposition is running in the family, you need to think about it very differently. Well said. Okay. So you also mentioned some tests to consider before your first biopsy or like if you're going through screening, and you, and you mentioned these PCA3, 4K, uh, PHI, select MDX, I think you said XODX, and then uh, MRI. So you're still, as, as, as life is going on, the years are going on, you're becoming more and more a fan of not just of getting a PSA, but if there's a concern there, right, you get one of these biomarker tests to add on to your screening protocol, right? They should yeah. ask the doctor. Yeah. But, yeah. but what's yeah. the catch with these? Aren't they too expensive or are they not? Yeah, the catch is they are they are pricey. The um, uh, the liquid tests are usually a few hundred dollars. Most of the companies have some sort of patient program where if insurance is not going to cover it, they will cap the out of pocket at something around 200, you know, on average across the tests. But they, even that is is not necessarily cheap. You know, MRI, which only costs a few hundred dollars in Europe and most other parts of the world here costs Know, thousands. Um, we are having less and less trouble getting insurance to cover the MRI, but it's definitely expensive. Uh, the other problem with MRI is there's a lot of inter-observer variability, meaning you know which radiologist happens to read the scan, we might get different results on it. Yeah. So for that reason, at least at UCSF, we tend to use the liquid markers first and then use the MRI to help guide the biopsy rather than to decide whether or not to do the biopsy. But there's other parts of the world, you know, the UK in particular, you don't get a biopsy without a lesion on MRI, period. Um, and that's partly because MRI is a lot cheaper, partly because there is much less access to these liquid markers. They're just not available there. So, you know, what makes sense kind of depends on the local environment. But, um, you know, we've used 
Uh, in the COVID era, you know, we used 4K very, fairly heavily because it's a send out blood test. And we yeah. used ExoDX a lot because they actually have a home kit. They just, you know, mail out a, a uh, urine test, be in the cup, mail it back, and, and we get the results. So it's been very good in an era where, where we were trying to keep folks out of the healthcare environment. Yeah, but I could see that. The, I mean, you become a big fan of these in screening when they're when they're needed, that the patient should ask about them or at least one of these tests and, and to, yeah. to pack on to the other things you do, right? So. Absolutely. Because again, the, the important point to stress here is that PSA, so when we think about PSA with a low threshold, we're thinking about it having a very good, what's called negative predictive value. Meaning if the test is negative, if it's under one, you can be pretty darn sure you don't have prostate cancer today and you're not going to die of prostate cancer for 20 years to come or more. It's got a very poor positive predictive value, meaning if it's over one or even over four, that still doesn't tell us very much. Maybe mm -hmm. if at least you get cancer, maybe you don't. These other tests that are coming out here are, you know, again, really nailed to the negative predictive values. The idea is if you have a marginal PSA, well, then we get a select MDX or an XODX or a 4K. If you're below the threshold of one of those tests, again, you have a 93, 95, 98% likelihood of not having a high grade cancer and we can safely defer the biopsy. None of them though tells us to have cancer. You know, we're not, none of them has a very good positive predictive value and none of them is at the point of replacing a, um, a biopsy. Unless obviously you have a PSA of 35 or you see an MRI with a, you know, a clear yeah. lesion, you know, outside the edge of the prostate. There are times it's obvious, but that's an unusual case in the spectrum of screening. Okay. So I think unless unless there's something else you wanted to talk about in screening, I, I wanted to make sure the audience could hear what the latest and greatest is going on with screening before we move on with active surveillance. Are we good there? Uh, the, only, the only other point I'd make is that the, you know, the guidelines, because again, this is, this is still really done by primary care. It's not done by urologists the vast majority of the time. And you know, the guidelines are all increasingly consistent in calling for some degree of shared decision-making at least. Um, I think can the explain, can you explain shared decision making? Yeah, yeah. We, so, you and I are used to that, but now it's the yeah. buzzword throughout medicine. I know. I know. And so the we, idea here is you're not supposed to the 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 provider or the doctor not supposed to just send a PSA on you as part of your annual blood draw without having a conversation first about what it's about and why we're doing it. To do this, you know, right, the CDC has a 17 page. I'm not kidding, 17 page decision aid about, you know, whether or not you should get a PSA test. And it talks about the risks of incontinence after surgery, you know, for high risk disease before you ever get a PSA. It's ridiculous. It's like talking about the risks of stroke after heart bypass before you check somebody's blood pressure or the risk of, you know, muscle breakdown before you, because uh, you took that before you check somebody's cholesterol. It's, it's totally impractical at the primary care level. You know, they have 15 minutes to cover everything in, in, uh, in that's going on in the person's life. It's totally impractical. We had a, um, a letter out uh, in Annals of Internal Medicine a few years ago, basically arguing this should be about a 30 second conversation to say that, you know, the reason we screen for prostate cancer is to find the aggressive cancers. If we do the screening, we might find a low risk one. If we find a low risk one, it doesn't need treatment. It is good for the men to hear that as early as possible. You know, definitely before we yeah. do a biopsy, ideally before we do the PSA. Um, and that's really about it, um, you know, and, and emphasize the point that we do save lives with this. Finding aggressive prostate cancer early without question saves lives. And that's really the balance, you know, and there are there are certainly men that would rather not know. Um, and, and most men, I would say in my experience, most men sort of would rather know in a brief presentation like that. And then, you know, if the PSA is high, then we have a much more nuanced conversation about how to go forward. Because again, 75% of the men, we can, we can, rule out for prostate cancer with this baseline test. So, you know, and that, and there are definitely nuances in the guidelines. The task force is still pretty, you know, the language they suggest you put into the shared decision-making is, is, you know, kind of ridiculous, but, um, <laughs> but we're getting there. I, and where, where the, where the task force still fails and frankly, the AUA guideline is also still limited is recommending screening starting at 55. And they do that because they have boxed themselves in by saying they're only going to address, they're only going to consider this one trial, the ERSPC trial, uh, that happened to include men 55 to 70 as their core age group. That trial did include some men starting at age 50, so there's no particular reason the guidelines couldn't have included that. And the guidelines explicitly do not consider evidence like this Malmo study and the other cohort studies that I mentioned, which, which in my view, and a lot of other folks in Epi's view, is, is a mistake methodologically. Yeah. Well, Here's here's the Cooper Cooperbergism. 
I'm, I'm going to say it enough times that it's going to flow. <laughs> the goal is not to identify prostate cancer. The goal is to identify lethal prostate cancer. Absolutely. And that's, and that's what you're saying. So I want, before we leave screening, I want to mention one quick topic that has to do with screening and active surveillance that I'm not seeing at meetings anymore. I mean, we go to similar and different meetings. Mm -hmm. So even the most recent meeting that you and I attended, there's three letters and maybe I'm missing it, but I really think this is an important part of the interview because I want to know what you think about it because we're hearing all sorts of opinions on it. There's three letters I'm not hearing much anymore. And the three letters are D, R, E. <laughs> yeah. Digital yeah. rectal exam. What yeah. the H-E double toothpicks has happened to that discussion? Is it yeah. still valid? Is it a part of screening? I, I know when we start talking about active surveillance that urologists utilize it for active surveillance on some level, I would assume. So can you just give us an idea of what's yeah, sure. going on with the D-R-E? Sure, sure. I thought you were going to ask me about Fernestra. No, no, that's coming uh, later. That's coming later. <laughs> <laughs> so DRE, uh, this has been a controversial question for a long time. You know, there are a lot of studies that came out in the PSA 4.0 threshold era that would say we're still going to pick up a lot of cancers with the DRE that we would miss with a PSA. That is true if you're using 4.0. Now, if you're using 1.0 or 1.5 or any kind of low threshold, the value of the DRE drops off tremendously. The value of a DRE by a primary care provider who we have to be honest, doesn't do it as often or with as much you know, attention as a urologist or cancer provider. It's got lower value anyway. And it's a big barrier to screening. Men will sort of you know, avoid prostate cancer screening because they don't want the finger exam. Um, and the reality is the yield of it, if we're using this threshold, is extremely low. Now, once the PSA is higher, once you've got a PSA on the record that's above, we can say one, we can say 1.5 or whatever you want, then DRE is no longer a screening test. Now it's part of working up the PSA. So a man who's got a low PSA, in my view, does not need a DRE, but a guy who has a elevated or even a marginal PSA does need the DRE as part of you know, decision-making in terms of what we're gonna do next. If he's got a big nodule in there, we potentially could even skip the MRI. We should just go straight to biopsy. Um, you know, you can get a sense of the prostate enormous. There's, ultimately, we're gonna get better information from imaging, whether it's an ultrasound or an MRI, than we ever will with a finger exam. But at the primary care level, uh, the DRE is still important only, I would say only for men who have at least a marginally elevated PSA. Okay. It doesn't have to be part of the first screening step. That's great. So here's where we're gonna spend the rest of our time, except for the very end, there's gonna be sort of a rapid fire, just <clears throat> what does Matt Cooperberg think about a variety of things across sure, my brain? Sure. So somehow we got to cover this in a simplistic fashion. And I don't even care if you want to use slides now or later, sure. but I, I really think, I mean, what I, when I tend to watch you at conferences, you tend to show very, you're very calm about the frustration you find with the lack of consensus or <laughs> in some of these things, but let's talk about, okay. So someone's di someone's been diagnosed with prostate cancer. Let's just go there. What's the yep. qualifications for active surveillance, right? And then we're going to cover, you know, what do you do to monitor? Do you come back and see me every six months? I know you can't be too specific, but, you know, how do you monitor and, 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 and what determines if I stay on it and what determines if I'm bumped off of active surveillance? So if we answer this in the next 30 to 40 minutes, then I, I think then we'll be doing a great service for people. Great. So this is all about the heterogeneity of prostate cancer, okay? And I'm, I'm gonna show another slide here because I've always loved this one. Uh, this is from Ian Thompson, who is, you know, always been one of my role models and rock stars in urology at, at, at UT Southwestern and Laura Esserman, who's a breast, uh, breast surgeon, breast oncologist here at UCSF with us. Mm -hmm. uh, they had this great letter, it's over 10 years ago now in, in JAMA, talking about screening for cancer in general. And the idea here, and this is, this is exactly the transition from screening to surveillance actually. Um, the idea is if you screen for any cancer on a periodic basis, whether you're doing PSAs, whether you're doing mammography, colonoscopies, whatever it is, you screen for cancer at a certain interval. And if you get to the top of the cartoon here, you've died of the cancer. If you get to the far right of the cartoon, you've died of something else, usually heart disease, as we just said. Um, and we know that in the case of prostate cancer, even with aggressive screening, there's a lot of them that we never find. Um, these are the so-called autopsy tumors. These are the ones that, you know, we, when we do autopsy studies, we find them, but even if a man lives to 80, um, he's never diagnosed with cancer. 
Then there are the ones that we find with screening. Uh, the man has an elevated PSA, gets a biopsy. We find Gleason 3 plus 3. We'll get to that in a little bit, but we find this low-grade cancer. Um, we can cure it. We can do surgery or radiation or focal therapy or whatever you want. We can wipe it out. But had we never found it, it would have never caused any symptoms or threatened the man's life. Um, then there are the ones that are higher grade or more aggressive. We find these when they're within the prostate. We cure these and we prevent what would have been a slow, painful death. Um, and there is no question these exist. And this is the ones treating the rabbits is how we have driven down that mortality rate in, in recent years. And then there are the so-called interval tumors where the PSA is 0 0.9, then it's 1.1, then it's three, uh, then it's five. And um, these we're not gonna win with screening. Fortunately, this is uncommon in prostate cancer. This is why we cannot screen for pancreatic cancer, for example. It tends to grow on a very compressed time frame. This is very unusual in prostate cancer. It happens, but it, this is rare. The snails don't matter. It's really all about the rabbits versus the turtles and how many turtles we've squished in the course of chasing the rabbits. And that has really been the, the controversy uh, with the task force and around active surveillance. And our job is to distinguish the rabbits from the, from the turtles um, and not overtreat the turtles, not crush the turtle population. Now there is this galling statement, even in the 2018 uh, US task force guideline that we cannot tell aggressive from indolent prostate cancer, high risk from low risk prostate cancer. That is nonsense. In 2018, we were already really good at it. We were good at it in 2010. We just haven't been doing it consistently as a treating community. So we know which ones are aggressive and which ones are not. The problem is, despite knowing that, we were over-treating low-risk disease. But to say that we can't tell is just wrong. By looking at the routine stuff that we know about every man sitting in the office, the PSA, the Gleason score, that's how the cells look under the microscope, the number of biopsy cores involved out of a 12 or 14 core biopsy, is it just one or is it all of them? Uh, the stage, is there any sign of cancer outside the edge of the prostate? If we put these things together, there's lots of different ways to do it. We have the CAPR score. Uh, there are nomograms, lots of different ways to do it. We're about 85% accurate in separating out the aggressive from the non-aggressive prostate cancers. Um, and this is very, very consistent and has been for a long time. Um, the, and I'll show another slide here. Um, what these, these we call the Kaplan-Meier plots. This is looking over time at the percent of men in a given category who survive the cancer. And the idea here, if you have, and these are real data from a registry called Capture, which we've run out of UCSF for many years, trying to yeah. treat it at 45 community practices across the country. So this is very much real world data. If you have a low risk tumor, basically nobody dies out to 15 years. Uh, you know, the ones that are a little more intermediate risk, we start to see, you know, some mix, some mm -hmm. of these do progress. On the other hand, high risk cancers, you know, half of, half of all men uh, may be dead of this within 10 years, despite treatment. And this, you know, this 85 number here, this is about 85% accurate. Um, and this is using just the basic criteria. Again, you know, PSA, Gleason score stage, et cetera. We can do even better by incorporating things like the PSA density. That's the yeah. PSA related to the size of the prostate. Because if you've got a huge prostate, well, that explains part of the PSA. We can look at PSA changes over time. We can look at how much pattern four there is. There's lots of nuances that we're getting for free, um, you know, without doing any other fancy biomarker work that can help us get even more precise in terms of trying to figure out the aggressive from the non-aggressive. And we'll go through those, but you, you brought up a name that is not brought up much in the patient world outside of UCSF, in my opinion. Look, um, it, it's very well known in the medical world and that's the CAPRA score. So people, people are diagnosed with prostate cancer. They want to log online. They want to go see how, you know, what's going to predict their outcomes in five and 10 years. And CAPRA is one of those. So I just did a search before we did this interview. I went CAPRA score and I just hit it on Google and it came up. So can you explain to people who are in that position with active surveillance or trying to decide how a CAPRA score can help? I mean, are you advocating people go online and do those? Absolutely. I mean, so, so CAPRA, there, look, there's lots of different ways to do risk stratification. Um, the most common one is a, an older system that is still the most commonly used. Um, when we think about the, well, the NCCN risk groups, the AUA risk groups, you basically get put into these boxes of low, intermediate, or high risk disease based on the PSA, the Gleason score, and the stage. Um, 
The problem is it's pretty outdated and has gotten very clunky. Um, and I'm, you know, I'll show another example here, actually, um, because the, the you wind up in this box whether you have one risk factor or all the risk factors within a given category. So this is just one example here, and I can I can show all the all the nitty gritty of how we calculate these things if you'd like. But um, this is one example. The guy on the left here, yeah. 76, he's got a PSA of 3.8. You know, T1C meaning it's a we can't feel the tumor. He's got a Gleason 3 plus 4, meaning it's mostly low grade with a little bit of intermediate grade. 10% of the cancer is intermediate grade. That's pattern four. And it's only in one out of the 12 cores. <clears throat> the guy on the right is younger. PSA, he's 57. He's got a PSA of 8.7. T2A tumor, meaning we can feel it on a DRE. Um, he's also got a 3 plus 4, but it's in more of the cores and more of the cancer is pattern four. Now, these are both so-called favorable intermediate if you uh -huh. run the classic sort of NCCN risk uh, classification, but they are very different. And I can tell you, you know, with clinical experience um, that the guy on the right has much more of a concerning tumor, patient number two, compared to patient number one. And we will see this with, with the CAPRA score. So mm -hmm. CAPRA and, and CAPRA was, we designed it and, and it's been validated you know, 30,000 patients around the world at this point. Um, and there's actually more and more citations of it every year these days, which is kind of interesting. 15 years after we published the original paper, um, you get one point for being over 50. You get one point if you have a three plus four or what we're now calling a Gleason grade group two. You get three points if you have a Gleason four plus three or higher or a Gleason grade group three or higher. Um, clinical stage T1 or T2 doesn't really matter. Um, but you do get a point if we suspect T3, meaning cancer outside the edge. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, you get one point if there are more than a third of the cores involved. So you get the zero to 10 score, which, you know, those of us that use it, I can calculate this in my head, you know, very quickly, almost as easy to use as the risk groups. And it's much more accurate. Um, that, that rainbow plot that I just showed with the survival curves, that is based on the, the CAPRA score. Uh, and like I said, we can we can get even more nuanced by looking at some of the subtleties of the pathology, what what types of patterns the pathologists are seeing under the microscope, uh, PSA density, et, et cetera. Okay. So CAPRA, so you do CAPRA, but uh, patients, you know, obviously anybody watching this can go do their own CAPRA at any time. Yes. Yeah. It's easy to find online. It's easy to find. I just don't, is it me? I just don't, I just don't think enough uh, patients know about it globally. Or am I wrong? I that may be true. Like I said, there are more and more citations of it every year in academic circles, but it is not in the guideline. The, you know, the NCCN guideline now still enshrines their risk groups. There is now some explanatory text in there that talks about nomograms and calculators and mentions the CAPRA score there are among some other equally accurate but more complicated systems. Yeah. Um, you know, I think. I am seeing it more and more in community urology notes, at least in the Bay Area here. Maybe that's our influence from UCSF. Um, a few of the biomarker companies are actually referencing their biomarkers to the CAPRA score, which is which is good. Um, so, you know, I think it's it's sort of slowly getting out there, but I agree, it's not as publicly known as as it probably should be. Well, we used to tell, uh, we used to tell, whether you're talking to public or lecturers or patients or students, in the old days, we'd say, you know, do a Framingham risk score, learn how to use it, encourage yep. patients to do it. I mean, I'm just picking off a cardiovascular score. CV risk calculator is one that I tell people to use. So for people in the Bay Area or not in the Bay Area, if someone is doing a CAPRA score after this, <clears throat> so it's as simple as then they print out their result and take it to their doctor. You encourage that. They would just do their own score if they're not getting one, right? Print yep. it out. Yep. And, and that helps in the discussion of whether or not to stay on active surveillance. Yeah, I mean, so let's, well, let's get into that. I mean, that, you know, so who who is eligible for surveillance and who is not is a very, it's, it's gotten to be a very nuanced conversation. Um, there was a, and, it, and it's, it's tightly related to how we do risk stratification. So in the NCCN, I mean, this probably is actually worth putting up because there was this big controversy late last year about exactly this question of who should get active surveillance. So in the risk group, system, um, and you'll see my opinion about this in the title of the slide here, um, you know, classically low risk disease here is somebody who has a PSA under 10, a Gleason grade group one, which is a three plus three or, or a Gleason six, that's all three terms for the same thing. And their clinical stage is T1 or T2, meaning we can't feel it or we can feel it, but it's small on one side of the prostate. Um, 
this is you know, low risk disease. Then there is this subset uh, designated very low risk disease. This comes from older work out of Johns Hopkins where they were trying to predict not only organ confined low grade tumors, but small tumors under half a cubic centimeter in size. It was a very, very stringent criterion. This was from the 90s. It's really never been updated. It just sort of got adopted into the NCCN guideline. So not only do you have to be Gleason grade group one, PSA less than 10, you have to have a PSA density less than 0.15, meaning not much PSA relative to the size of the prostate. Um, you cannot have any more than half of any biopsy core involved with cancer. And you have to have less, you can only have one or two biopsy cores uh, actually involved with cancer. Uh, and that is a huge problem in this day and age when we are doing targeted biopsies. So more and more men are getting their biopsies done with MRI guidance or with very careful ultrasound guidance, high frequency ultrasound. So we're taking extra cores of visible lesions um, so it's getting very difficult to have only two cores of cancer because we're going after these lesions. Um, so that criterion has always been too stringent and now it's basically ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, but the NCCN late last year shifted their guideline without a lot of fanfare to say, well, we recommend active surveillance as preferred management uh, for very low risk. For low risk, well, you can do whatever you want. You can do surgery, radiation or, or surveillance, which was really... A, a sort of disappointing shift in the recommendation. There was a bit of a storm on social media about this and a lot of editorials came out. You know, we yeah. wrote one of them um, and they, they've actually now reverted to saying active surveillance is preferred for all low risk disease. And certainly, you know, our perspective at UCSF and mine is that basically anybody with low risk, so PSA less than 10, uh, Gleason, uh, Gleason grade group one and clinical stage T1 or two, should be eligible for, for AS, for surveillance. The question is not about the very low. For us, the question is which of the men in the intermediate box are also yeah. eligible. Till a few years ago, that was sort of where we would, where we would draw the line. Um, you know, Gleason grade group one, Gleason six, you're good. If you have Gleason seven, you need to think about treatment. Um, the Toronto series with Lori Klotz early on uh, did include men with Gleason seven on active surveillance. And they reported you know, significantly higher progression rates in that group but they were allowing a lot of Gleason 7s in, even men with, with four plus threes and higher volume tumors. Yeah. We're very selective about it. So the right men with a grade group two or a, or a Gleason 7 who should be eligible for surveillance has a three plus four. So it's mostly three with only a little bit of four, probably ideally only five to 10% of the cancer should be pattern four. We do look at these subtypes, these nuances. So uh, the fused gland subtype of pattern four definitely does better and is safer than the ones that our designated cribriform or expansile cribriform. Um, we will sometimes you know, allow men with higher PSAs in if we have a good reason for it. If they've got a 100 gram prostate and a PSA of 12, that's fine. They've got a PSA of 12 because they have a 100 gram I prostate. Say. So there's lots of ways that we are, we are pushing into the intermediate risk territory that we think is, is safe. And then for borderline cases, this is where genomics can be very helpful. So we do things like Decipher and other genomic tests for men where we're kind of on the fence. You know, is this safe for surveillance or not? That's where these tests can be quite helpful. I called it the, I, whenever I watch your lecture, I call it the POD acronym. I, I got too much in my brain. You know, Polaris, Oncotype, Decipher, yeah. right? So, so these post-diagnosis markers to keep you on active surveillance or not, let me just play devil's advocate. Why wouldn't ever everybody who's been diagnosed just ask to have that marker done? Yeah, because like we said before, the liquid tests after PSA yeah. are a few hundred dollars. These tests are a few thousand dollars. I um, know, but this could, you know, they can make or break whether or not you have significant. I, I agree. I agree. Look, I, there's a lot of controversy about this in terms of how they should be used. And, you know, the, where the evidence stands on these tests, they all work. Okay, even yeah. if you set a high bar with a Capra score or, or some multivariable model, they all improve our ability to predict which cancers are gonna do well and which ones are not. Um, however, it's a relatively small proportion of cases where we really shift things with the test. In other words, most cancers that are very low risk clinically or are, you know, I would say low risk, not using the NCCN terminology. In most cases, if we get a biomarker, it just confirms what we already knew, which is this is low risk. Yeah. Um, so it's overkill. And it's, it, it's just not a good use of resources to run this on everybody who's got one core of Gleason 3 plus 3. Um, it just doesn't make any sense because the vast majority of those cases, we know what to do. You but know? if a four comes back on any level, it's 5%. Yeah, that's, that's different. I Yes. That's, you would do it? 
I, we get it on, I mean, not everybody, if it's a, if it's a 79 year old, I mean, if, so we really do look at the patient too, you know, in, in terms of surveillance, if it's a, if it's a 49 year old versus a 79 year old, that's a big difference in terms of how aggressively we're going to look for something worse. If it's a 79 year old with two strokes and a heart attack under his belt compared to a 79 year old who brings both of his parents to the exam and, you know, takes nothing but aspirin, you know, those are very different people yeah. too, in terms of how aggressively we want to make sure we didn't miss something. But you got to remember too, you know, one of these older trials, the, the pivot trial, uh, which, you know, there's a lot of controversy over interpreting it and, you know, it, you know, not to get into too many details on that, you know, that what this showed was for low risk disease. This is based on men who had a six core biopsy, mostly done by trainees in the VA system in the 1990s, mm. um, meaning they missed a lot of worse cancer in calling these cancers low risk, there was not a shred of benefit for treatment versus watchful waiting, never mind active surveillance. Meaning that we shouldn't be looking too terribly hard to find worse cancer in who have what looks like low risk disease. Um, we do undersample a proportion of men. So we find what looks like low risk, there's actually something worse in there. And eventually that will make itself known, but we are gonna get back into an over treatment uh, reference point, if we chase down every low risk tumor and look for every single tiny little, you know, one millimeter focus of fuse gland pattern four, and then recommend that man for treatment. Well, how, uh, okay. So I think, you know, we've gone from my lifetime from watchful waiting, active surveillance, that sounds all right to now it's a big deal. And a lot of people are on it. I mean, you guys have one of the largest mm -hmm. uh, groups there in active surveillance or patients, but how do you even generally instruct these men once they're told, okay, now you're on active surveillance, yeah. you qualify for this select group. Yep. This is how I'm going to monitor you. Cause I've yeah. heard it. I've heard everything come back oh, yeah. in three months, come back in six months, come yep. back in nine months, yep. come yep. back yep. once a year, do it, do this, do that. I mean, what are some of your general guidelines? And now that you're in this select group, how often do you come back and I'm going to see you? So this is, in rapid evolution, I would say. So the, the major cohorts used to have fairly fixed protocols. Johns Hopkins, it used to be biopsy every single year. You know, yeah. when we started, you know, the UCSF cohort, when Peter Carroll started in the, in the mid nineties, it was pretty regimented PSA every three months. We got ultrasound every six months. It was biopsy every year, then went to every two years. Um, but it's now getting much more nuanced. First of all, we've learned that in the community, none of this is actually happening. Um, you know, men that go on active surveillance, in, uh, in your state, which has one of the best prostate cancer registries anywhere, the music registry, and is really focused on, on active surveillance as one of their main quality planks um, across the state. They did a great study looking at how many men who start on active surveillance get even three PSAs and one biopsy in the first two years. It was like 25%, mm -hmm. um, very low. So what, what's really happening in, in community is actually probably not adequate in terms of intensity of surveillance but we're learning now that we really can customize this and personalize it. So when we start a man of surveillance, yeah, initially I am, I am a big advocate for confirmatory biopsy, meaning if I see somebody who's been biopsied and diagnosed somewhere else, we will typically do an MRI and a biopsy at UCSF within the first year to make sure we haven't missed something. Because sometimes, you know, the original biopsy can miss pretty significant cancers that we definitely do want to know about. And we see those every year. You know, it's a lower proportion than it used to be. And, you know, we used to upgrade about 30% or more to higher grade cancer. It's still around 20%. I mean, it still definitely happens. Hmm. Now, if that confirmatory biopsy confirms low grade, low volume, low risk disease, then we are really trying to now spread out the intervals, especially between the biopsies as much as we can. So we've learned from, a, we're, we're part of this great consortium study called the Canary Pass study, uh, which has been tracking men on active surveillance for years now. Yeah. Uh, we had a paper out a couple of years ago, really showing we don't need to check PSAs every three months. We do just as good of a job checking every six months. Okay. And a subsequent paper we put out um, a year and a half ago showed that if we look at clinical factors, again, this doesn't even need, doesn't, we don't even have to get into the biomarker space yet. If we look at things like how the PSA is changing over time, uh, whether we have seen negative biopsies after diagnosis, doesn't mean the cancer went away. It means it was so small that we couldn't even find it the second time. We can look at uh, BMI, which tends to affect PSA, a few other factors like that. We can now identify pretty good subcohorts of men, 20, 25% of men who are starting on active surveillance, who we can confidently say 85%, 90% of 
uh, negative predictive value for upgrading, basically we can tell them go home, come back in five years for a biopsy. We barely need to check a PSA. We don't. We certainly don't need to put you through a biopsy for for years. And we're also starting to use MRI cautiously as a replacement for biopsy if everything has been stable for a while. So in other words, if the diagnostic biopsy and the confirmatory biopsy both show low risk disease and the MRI was either clean or showed a small lesion and a follow-up MRI two years later looks exactly the same, uh, then I'm, we're starting to get more and more comfortable accepting that MRI as a surrogate for the biopsy. That is controversial and is definitely evolving quickly. And I'm not, there are people out there that will like use the MRI to, to replace even a diagnostic biopsy or the confirmatory biopsy. I don't think we're there, yeah, but I think yeah. if we have a couple biopsies under, under the belt and things are consistently you know, favorable or safe, then I'm starting to feel better about the, the accuracy of the, of the MR. So there's some idea in terms of criteria. I, I guess I, I kind of go back and not to harp back on this, but again, if you're asking people to come back every six months or every year, again, I, I hate to say this because I just haven't heard the words. DRE is always a part of that. So DRE is still listed in everybody's protocols. Um, the reality is for two years now, we've been doing almost everything by Zoom and okay. it has been fine, right? I mean, the idea that we're going to pick up a progressive cancer by DRE where we didn't see it by MRI or ultrasound is just, it's just not gonna happen. Absolutely. So it's still technically part of all the surveillance protocols, but the reality is it's becoming less and less important. Okay. I, I hate to do this, but I, just uh, briefly, cause you've, you've brainwashed me a little bit. And that is, I don't wanna panic people, but you did show a slide at a recent conference that showed that MRI is great. You gotta use MRI within active surveillance with certain guidelines but you're still to the point where around the country, there's just not a lot of, there's not a lot of consensus in terms of, there's a lot of people who aren't necessarily great at reading MRI. That's how I translated your slide. Can you elaborate? Sure. It's a, so there is a consistent guideline in terms of how to read a prostate MR. It's called the PIREDS system. Uh, but there's a lot of inconsistency in the way the radiologists actually assign the points to calculate the PIREDS score and it takes a lot of expertise um you know and i think this is not necessarily recognized out there in, in the world um you know some a lot of radiology tests are very easy and very consistent if you need a cat scan of your kidneys you can show up to pretty much any cat scan center get the cat scan and any radiologist is going to be able to look at your kidneys and and describe what they see uh, prostate mr is not like that um it takes actually i only learned a couple of years ago how much subtlety there is even in setting up the machine. A hospital can have two Siemens or two GE MRI machines and they have to be calibrated differently. Hmm. Um, so, and then how you set up the prostate package, basically how you actually set up the MR protocol for MR takes a lot of experience. And then reading the multiparametric MR uh, definitely takes a lot of expertise. And there've been some great studies out there showing a lot of variation. Um, you know, Stanford down the street from us, uh, does maybe not quite the volume we do, but they're certainly a high volume prostate MR center. They published a great study, which I'm sure if we had the courage to repeat it, we'd find the same thing, you know, depending on which Stanford University radiologist happens to read your MRI, the likelihood that a PIREDS-5, meaning a high, you know, bad looking lesion actually represents a high grade cancer, grade group two or higher, ranges from 40% to 80%, you know, within a, within a university. Uh, and this has been shown repeatedly, even at, you know, the NCI is the best MR center in the country, probably. Uh, same thing. They've got two radiologists there that are super high volume and do nothing but prostates. And they're really good. But when you take the still reasonable volume, you know, middle volume NCI radiologists, their agreement drops off very rapidly. So, you know, it's not, I've, I've got, I've, I've developed this reputation as being anti-MR. I'm, I'm not at all anti-MRI. We do a ton of anti-MRI. Um, but you know, MRI is, is, a, is a test. We will drag the patients down three hours from Northern California to get the MRI done here at UCSF. And, you know, and we're, and I'm very cautious about accepting it as a replacement for biopsy until we're better at interpreting them. There's a lot of interest in machine learning and AI systems to do a better job with the information there. And there's plenty, there's lots of other very cool tech and development to improve our, our imaging. But what you're saying to me is because I'm thinking of the tangibility of all of this, yeah. you know, the patients who are watching. Sure, sure. That if there's any concern about the person reading your MRI in terms of experience, I'm, I'm going to try to be delicate here. 
the, the you made it you may need to think about either getting it at another place or having it read by someone else as a second opinion. Do you agree with that? Let me be even more forceful about it. Every okay. single aspect of prostate cancer care after the PSA, I'm talking about the MRI, the biopsy, treatment discussions, having surgery, radiation, this should all be done at centers of excellence. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be an academic center, but it's got to be a place that focuses on this. Some of the big community urology groups have a few urologists that have you know, prostate cancer is what they do, just like it is for us in academics. That's fine. But you know that you are always going to get better care in subspecialty centers for prostate cancer than you will with someone who sees a few of them a year and is taking care of kidney stones and BPH and incontinence and everything else yeah. in general urology practice, um, almost, you know, across the board. And that's, and that is true. And fortunately, prostate cancer is almost never an emergency. You know, we have this problem in, in bladder cancer where we know the clock is really ticking. We have the same situation where outcomes are better in academic centers, but if you don't get your bladder either under chemo or out within three months of diagnosis of a high-grade bladder cancer, you are much more likely to die of the disease. Prostate is not like that. This thing moves slowly. You have months, you have years in some cases. So take the time to get to a center where this is what we eat, breathe, live, and sleep. Um, yeah, because no, that's well said, because better. a lot of people will say, so I think I know where you fall on this. A lot of people will say, I got to decide immediately. Yeah. And there's this old saying now, that I hopefully is coming out that it's better to decide in a smart fashion than decide in a quick fashion. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Okay. So now I'm going to go through other criteria in the Moyad mind. And I just want you to comment on them. And some of them are going to be repetitive. If you're going to be on active surveillance or coming off active surveillance, let's pick off a couple of these and tell me what you think for the active surveillance patient. Okay. I want to cover family history and genetics, and I want to cover this BRCA one and two test. I, I predicted at the last meeting that you were there that in five, 10 years, that everybody who's going to be on active surveillance will get a BRCA1 or 2 test to see if they have that mutation. And if they do, they're less likely to stay on active surveillance or they'll be monitored more aggressively. What say you? Does everyone get a 23andMe <laughs> test or whatever it is? Because they're doing it on the women's side. Yep. What okay. do you say about every man watching this in the future <laughs> getting a test for his BRCA1 and 2 mutation? Yeah, there's like five questions packaged in there. So um, good at that. first of all, not everybody needs to get a BRCA test. Um, if you've got a family history, the criteria, there actually are pretty clear guidelines now in terms of who should get a genetic test, meaning a, we, and we use these terms, the terms get confusing. When we talk about genetics, we're usually talking about what's called germline genetics, meaning the DNA that you're born with, that you got from your mom and your dad, right. uh, that drive your risk of getting a cancer. When we use the term genomics, we're usually talking about the way that the DNA has actually mutated or has been dysregulated in the cancer cells themselves. Yes. Yes. So when you're asking about BRCA, uh, we're talking about uh, genetics. This is a BRCA are, are these uh, genes that are part of the way the cell repairs its DNA and keeps the DNA, the text of the DNA accurate and proofread as the cells divide. And if you've got, if you've got a mutation in one of these, you are more prone to breast, prostate, and ovarian cancers. Um, so there are pretty clear guidelines now for people with a strong family history of prostate or of prostate, breast, and ovarian cancer running in a family. Yeah, they should get BRCA testing. But um, you know, is that a reason that every sort of you know, person off the street should get a 23andMe or an Invite and, and get their genotype done? Not necessarily. And what we don't really know is what to do differently with the results. And my, my clinic these days, I have a lot of men who are showing up because their sister or their aunt or somebody got an early breast cancer. They got screened, found out to have a BRCA mutation. And now the, so the man now got screened and has one and is now in my office with a PSA of 1.1 and a BRCA mutation. And it's very unclear what we actually do. I definitely think men should be screened with PSA early if they have a BRCA, but there's not yet any sense that we should biopsy at a lower threshold or treat more aggressively yet. Um, the big, there's the, the best study on this so far comes from Hopkins in terms of active surveillance. And uh, this one is worth showing too, I think. So they looked at their active surveillance series um, looking at men who had these mutations. So BRCA2 is the one most closely associated with prostate cancer. BRCA1 is, is more, it, it is a risk factor for prostate cancer, but much more for breast cancer. Um, and then ATM is another gene in this family of, of genes, you know, in the same sort of pathway of DNA repair. 
So if they looked at men who had any of these three mutations or BRCA2 specifically, they just looked at their likelihood over time of progressing to a higher grade cancer on surveillance, having started with a grade group one or the odds of winding up with a grade group two or higher. And what you can see here, the blue line is the men who do not have the mutation. So out to 10 years, um, about 40% of them upgrade. And it happens almost all those men got treated. If you have one of these mutations, if you have any of the three, uh, likelihood of upgrading was 65% by 10 years. If you have BRCA2 specifically, it was nearly 80%. Mm. Um, so a lot of people look at these data and say, we should not do active surveillance for men with BRCA mutations. I personally don't think that's the right interpretation. Um, because the question is, you know, just because you might upgrade in the next six years does not mean you're going to die of prostate cancer if we don't take out your prostate today. And this is a really important point about active surveillance in general. Okay, active surveillance is different from watchful waiting. Uh, you know, watchful waiting was an older con concept which says we find a prostate cancer, but you're the 79 year old with two heart attacks and a stroke under your belt. Don't worry about this. Your heart's probably going to get you a decade before your prostate. In the unlikely event that you develop a progressive cancer that's causing you symptoms, come back and we will treat you with hormonal therapy, et cetera. That was watchful waiting. Active surveillance is very different. It says we have every intention and expectation of curing this cancer if we see signs of progression, uh, right. because we think we can catch that progression event um, pretty early and treat with every intention of cure. Now, mathematically, so the, and the question with surveillance is always, what are the odds that today the cancer is curable and next year or at whatever time we find this, this progression event, it will be too late and the cancer will have spread. Mathematically, that number is not zero. By definition, there will always be some cancers that escape, but it is a really, really, really small number. You know, we talk about 30% progression, 60% progression. Yes, but those are typically just sort of either reclassified or we find them well within the window of opportunity. You know, that window of opportunity to cure is years. It's decades in many cases. So, you know, way less than 1% of men are actually going to have a rapidly progressive cancer. Those the bird type tumors. Yeah. So, you know, if we say you've got a 60% chance of needing treatment, of progressing in the next 10 years and needing treatment, okay, great. So first of all, you have a, you know, 50% chance of not needing treatment in the next five years. Uh, you tell me I can get to, you know, five years out and tell me I'm going to need treatment at age 60 instead of 55 and get treated in 2027 instead of 2022. Um, you know, I, that's a fairly good deal as long as we know it's safe. So our practice, I will offer surveillance to none of these mutations. But it's more careful surveillance. These are not the guys that I'm going to say come back in five years. These are the guys that definitely need their PSA check. They definitely need the MRIs, the biopsies, et cetera. And these BRCA mutations we're talking about, going back to the genetics, we're talking yeah. about these are germline tests. These are germline what, tests. These, these are the genetics they're born with. We're not talking right. about in the tumor, which we can have a whole other lecture on. Yeah. This is the simple cheek swab or blood test, correct? Correct. correct. All right. What about age? Have you ever had someone that was too young to be on active surveillance or too old? Do you think there's any, do you think that there is any limit of age, either too young or too old for active surveillance, or is that just out the window? Definitely not too young. And it is, it is a really important point because we have absolutely no business doing early baseline PSAs on men at 45. If we're not going to put that guy on surveillance, when the baseline PSA leads to a diagnosis of a Gleason 3.3 at 45. Um, you know, and if I find a 33 and a 45 year old, I will usually tell him he's not going to make it to 90 without having something done to his prostate, but he could make it 10 years. He can make it 20 years, uh, without needing something done. So, you know, again, surveillance does not mean never, it means not now for treatment. And we absolutely have to offer surveillance to, to younger men. If we are going to screen younger men, and there's even data that younger men have a lower risk of progressing. Uh, in terms of grade over the first five years on surveillance. Uh, the too old is a different question. That's actually a more interesting question of how do we transition men from active surveillance to watchful waiting? At what point do we say, look, we've been watching this thing for 15 years. Um, you're now 82. You did have a heart attack last year. The PSA has been flat forever. Let you sail off into the sunset. Um, you know, we're actually not great about that. We don't have a protocol. I was just in a meeting with some of the urologists in the UK, and they're, they're much more protocolized about it. You know, they've got age and sort of biopsy criteria, and they just stop. Uh, and, you know, most of the time, you know, patients have different reactions to it. Yeah, Some uh, of them, you know, are, are sort of relieved to be told they don't have to worry about this ever again. 
other men are still really anxious about it, even though they're still smoking at 83 and this is clearly not going to be their problem. Uh, they don't want to stop. And, and so for them, we'll at least keep, we'll continue checking PSA once a year, but we really try to back off on that. I mean, in the Bay Area, come on, it's not different from Ann Arbor or other places. There's an old joke. You don't want us to live to be 107, the guy who's 106. Yeah. In other words, people, that, and that's their choice. I, I don't blame it. So but let me get, throw in some more thoughts about active surveillance. I used to read in the old data that anxiety would get you off of it, that people would just had too much anxiety. I heard the C word. How do you handle that today with the uh, the anxiety that people deal with because they heard the C word? So that is a real phenomenon. I will say most of the blame, again, lies with us. Um, it is it is an important part of my job to pull people back from that cliff. Now, this is the point we were making before about shared decision-making. It is much easier to... Uh, pull the guy back from the cliff if he's not standing on the cliff in the first place because he knows before we did the biopsy or better yet before we did the PSA that if we find Gleason grade group one we don't care uh, and it's not going to need treatment and if and if and if it is clear from the outset um, that the reason we do the screening the reason we do the biopsies is to find high grade cancer it's much easier to have that conversation. So I always tell them, and it's, it's not a yes or no answer. It's a yes, no, or sort of answer. You know, either we find a high grade cancer that we need to talk about treatment, we find nothing, or we find a low grade cancer that we're gonna watch. You know, if that is clear from the beginning, it's much easier to have the conversation. Uh, yeah. There are, to be clear, you know, occasional men who just can't get past it. I actually operated for the first time in years on a Gleason three plus three, you know, just a few months ago. Uh, because after 45 minutes, it was clear I was just not going to get anywhere. He was, yeah. you know, he was, he was in a health field. He just, you know, he was just a little bit too educated. Um, and, you know, so it happens. Um, but it should be a very, very small minority of men that, you know, that, that really can't get past it. And look, there's, there's plenty of other reasons, too. Men that have a low-grade cancer and severe BPH symptoms, for yeah. example, you know, you can kill two birds with one stone in some cases by doing a prostatectomy, for example. So, I mean, there's there's plenty of, of edge cases. You know, you show me a 52-year-old guy with a high volume Gleason 3 plus 3 and a really strong family history. Um, you know, if it's clearly a question of when, not if, we're going to intervene and that man would really rather have it done today than five years from now, that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say that the target rate should probably be 80%, not 100% in terms of how many low risk men should be surveilled. Okay. Uh, the, the, the question you were dreading, BPH drugs, do tasteride and finasteride, yeah. that can shrink the prostate. Yeah. We say, you could say 20, 30%, that can change your PSA. What do you do with these guys on active surveillance? Cause there was a time when we thought this might help. Some people still think yeah. it might. What do you tell, what do you yeah. do with these drugs that can uh, cloud the picture? How's that? Yeah. Yep. Well, first of all, we've got a trial. You know, the, the REDEEM trial showed that using dutasteride reduced the likelihood of progressing to treatment by about 25%, mostly because it drops the PSA and helps with the anxiety. Um, you know, we will mentally double the PSA for men on surveillance, but, a, but these drugs are great in that they will drop the PSA. They also stabilize the PSA. So a rising PSA on one of these pills, finasteride or dutasteride, is uh, a much more consistent sign of a progressive cancer yeah. than a rising PSA for somebody who is not on, on one of these medications. Um, that's interesting. So that's the first point. Um, they, they sort of fell out of favor because of this whole business with the FDA, um, you know, it was found in the early trials, and you're shaking your head because you, you know, like I do this, is ridiculous. They, they um, you know, when men go on these medications, we find more high grade disease. And there was all this controversy, are they actually driving the cancer to be higher grade? Obviously it's not. And there've been tons of analyses showing pretty clearly, all we're doing is diagnosing high grade disease more consistently because finding yeah. the high grade cancer, especially in the pre-imaging era, you're looking for a needle in a haystack. Well, if you make the haystack smaller, you're more likely to find that needle with the same number of biopsy cores. Well so despite that clear logic, there is still this black box warning on the drugs about driving high grade disease. So they're not used often. I personally use them for men who have low grade cancer plus BPH and they're not heading for surgery, but also have a lot of symptoms or men where the PSA is just really high and we don't have a good explanation for it. Um, you know, the prostate is not that, not that enormous, but we've done two biopsies. Both of them show two cores of three, three, um, but the PSA is 18 and, you know, and stays up there. I've had a few men like that who we put on finasteride and it falls by like 80%. You know, wow. and yeah. you can't explain it, but everybody feels better when the PSA is lower and they have few side effects, you know, 5% roughly, 
will have sexual side effects. Uh, it can make your hair a little thicker. This is the same stuff that's in Propecia. Yeah. Um, and I think they're probably underused, quite honestly. That's really interesting, your opinion on that. It's nice to hear. So we're talking about finasteride, which was known as Proscar, Dutasteride, which is known as Avodart. Yeah. So you should have a discussion. I mean, I don't want I don't downplay the side effects from them, but at the same time, there is this kind of thinking that if a drug's been out there for 20 years, you got to find every possible thing that's wrong with it. <laughs> Yeah. scare people uh, but i obviously some people don't do well with it some people do so at least it's a part of active surveillance so your tangible point is if you're on any of these drugs and including the hair drug how about right. that and right. the psa starts to go up that might be telling you that the disease is in progression right yes. that's yeah, and that's, I, that's a really strong point and, and actually to emphasize the point about propecia about the hair drug uh, men tend not to report this on their medication lists when you tell your doctor what medications you're taking men tend not to report propecia and it absolutely counts so propecia is a one milligram finasteride as opposed yeah. to the five milligram finasteride the proscar that we use for bph but even the one milligram can drop your psa and there was a nice study out of the va uh, a couple of years ago because primary care docs still think about the 4.0 threshold um, they were not referring men for evaluation who had a PSA, even like you know, 3.8, 3.9 on finasteride. So by the time they crossed the threshold, it's really like an eight. So there were actually higher death rates for men on finasteride in the VA than men not on finasteride because of delayed diagnosis. So wow. very important to report this to, to your docs. That's really good. Here's the other one quickly I want to go through before I just, we just threw some just random stuff. Uh, we didn't talk about, we talked about PSA, but can we just, can we just review again? Do you use PSA kinetics, velocity, doubling time? And you definitely use PSA density. I, I, right. I, I just, yeah. can we just, can you just emphasize that active surveillance relies on PSA kinetics and definitely PSA density. You say yeah. what? So density for sure. Again, if you've got a huge prostate that we can write off the PSA to having a huge prostate. And that's the concept of PSA density. The threshold that's out there is 0.15. You know, over that we get a little bit more concerned. 0.12 to 0.15 is sort of a gray area. Below 0.12 is is uh, reassuring. So that's equivalent to a PSA of you know 12 and setting of 100 gram prostate would give you a 0.12. It's literally just division arithmetic. Uh, the yeah. PSA kinetics are more complicated. Um, you know, the original protocols would say if your doubling time is less than two years or three years, uh, that's a red flag. Doubling time can be tricky to calculate. The work that we did with Canary. We actually calculated a little bit more of a complicated PSA parameter called PSAK, PSA kinetics. It requires a calculator to do this well, but it's a little bit more accurate. It's looking at the PSA trend in relation to sort of the whole population of prostate cancer patients. You can calculate this on the website. Um, I will tell you quite honestly, I think a lot of us tend to sort of gestalt the PSA trends. Um, you know, we'll graph them on the graph in the clinic or just take a look at the, at the chart and just get a sense of which way the wind is blowing. Because yeah. again, we're not, I, I will very rarely tell somebody you need to be treated based on the PSA trend. But what I will say is we're doing a biopsy this year, this month, not waiting another year because the PSA is going up. And I don't have a, I personally don't have a hard threshold in terms of doubling time, 24 months or anything like that. We really do just sort of look at the, look at the trend. But that PSA density lower is better that, you know, someone can calculate that at home and take it to their yeah. doctor. It's not a big Absolutely. deal, right? And so Here's the random, here's the other random stuff I want to pick off from active surveillance in your comment. And so we can end in the next 10 minutes. This paper just came out in the journal of urology. I hate to throw this at you, but some of your colleagues were on this paper. Some of my colleagues were on this paper, Eric Klein, all, you know, all the big names. It said here, patients with high volume Gleason GG1 tumors. So, you know, high volume Gleason 6 behave similar to those with intermediate and high risk tumors. So they're now making the claim that from their database, they're looking at that if you've got a Gleason 6, a 3 plus 3, but you got a lot of it, a lot of it and a lot of cores, that this might be one of the reasons you come off active surveillance. Yes or no? No, not in my view. Uh, we have, look, we have, there are tens of thousands of patients. Scott Egner has done a lot of this work, and he and I are, we actually have an editorial that's going to come out again, raising this point that we got to stop using the C word for Gleason 6. Um, okay. Because it does, if you look at patients that have a pure Gleason 6 and went to surgery, the metastatic rate is basically zero across tens of thousands of patients. This is not cancer, the way we think of cancer. It looks like cancer to a pathologist, but biologically, molecularly, genetically, genomically, it doesn't behave like cancer. So what is true is if you have a high volume Gleason 6, it's more likely that there is also a pattern for hiding somewhere, somewhere in there amongst okay. all the pattern six. 
amongst all the Gleason 6. So high volume Gleason 6 needs closer surveillance, just okay. like the BRCAs, just like the high PSAs, et cetera. But I will very rarely take somebody to surgery. Now, now like I said a few minutes ago, if you are, you know, you're in your early 50s, you've got a high volume tumor, maybe you have a family history. If it's clear that, you know, it's a when, not if, and you want it done sooner, that's fine. But I would absolutely not say that tumor volume is an eligibility criteria in practice surveillance. But at least it brings up the idea that you've got to really be careful for that, those fours that pop up on active surveillance. In fact, your last paper that your name was on, you were a second author, is a molecular risk looking at Gleason 3 plus 4 prostate cancer. Yes. And what you were saying in this paper, was cribriform, this type of cribriform pattern, right? Yes. If you see yes. this, if you see this cribriform pattern, uh, it tends to mean it's got a little bit more of an aggressive four and you're probably, am I safe to say you're probably not a good active surveillance candidate? And by the way, before you answer the question, I have to get some therapy in. Not only did I grow up with Farsi and German and English, but my mom made me take Latin. So I knew what cribriform <laughs> meant in Latin. Cribiform means sieve. It means perforated area. <laughs> That's what it looks like on pathology. It looks like a sieve. But tell me, tell me, before we end on active surveillance, what does a patient do if they get this reading on biopsy or pathology? Yeah. So first of all, this is yet another reason to be seen in a high volume center because there is, just like there's subtlety in the radiology exams and subtlety in doing the surgery and subtlety in interpreting the PSA trends, there's a lot of subtlety in pathology interpretation. And it is always worth having the slides re-reviewed by a, a prostate-focused subspecialized pathologist. A lot of community pathologists are, you know, more and more of them are making these distinctions, but most of them still do not. Um, you know, most of the, I think almost all the major academic centers now do this. So Gleason pattern four has these subclassifications, and cribriform is one of the more aggressive ones. We are even substratifying the cribriforms into expansile versus non-expansile. The expansiles are worse. But yeah. yes, I think that's a fair statement that if you see cribriform on the pathology report, that is a yellow flag. It doesn't mean you're absolutely ineligible for surveillance, but those are the ones that we are much more cautious about. And so if they don't report, if your pathologist doesn't even report cribriform absent, cribriform present, you got to get that looked at again. Yeah, they and they they well they might not use that language present absent, but they should give a subtype of the pattern four. Yeah. So our you know our our center for example, they're not going to say cribriform absent, but they will say the subtype of pattern four is, and if it's fused gland or or um, you know poorly formed glands, for example, that's the more favorable, and, and we know that. But they yeah, and they should inquire about that because so yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. It is always worth having the slides re reviewed by you know most centers. UCSF does you know, reviews for anybody that wants them. Hopkins does a ton of them. Um, it's, it's not difficult to do. So the goal, so part of the gold message here from the Cooperberg, Dr. Cooperberg, is that that's not just the extent of four in active surveillance, how much four there is. It's that subtype of four Absolutely. that can make or break whether or not you stay on Absolutely. active surveillance. Absolutely. That is awesome. The other thing that's awesome is that do you have chance? Do you have one a random question? Is you want to just have time, or do you have to go? Sure, I mean, sure. Because you you made me think about this, and I realized that no one's. I've never had anybody address this, and I, I I this is this is not a softball question. You talked about at a meeting, uh, figuring out who needs post op radiation and who doesn't. Uh huh. And a lot of people think if they get surgery, they get treatment. They don't need to have post op radiation. They're done. But do you have any advice on? Who should consider if they're going out and getting surgery? Who should consider a follow-up radiation or not? How do you even start that conversation? I mean, <laughs> whole yeah, whole different I, conversation in the last. I know it's a whole but, different, uh, but but shouldn't it, yeah. it should come up though with your doctor, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. So so first of all, you know, the goals of surgery. Obviously, our goal is to cure when we do surgery. But um, some cancers recur despite surgery, and some cancers we know are high risk going in. And if you think about a high risk rectal cancer, breast cancer, you know, the right answer is all the above. People get surgery, chemo and radiation do. by plan from the get-go. Um, if we're gonna combine treatments in prostate cancer, no question it is better to do surgery followed by radiation than to do radiation and try to come in with surgery. Surgery after radiation is possible. Some people say it's impossible. It's possible, but it's a lot more difficult and higher oh, yeah. risk. Yeah. Um, so, you know, my surgical practice tends to be pretty high risk patients. So a lot of patients that I've done are going to need radiation after the fact. Um, and our and PSA here is a spectacularly good test. If your PSA is undetectable, 
uh, after surgery, you are fine. You know, we have, there's been lots of discussion over the years about adjuvant radiation, which means giving radiation just based on the pathology report. We find that the cancer was outside the edge, the, maybe the margin was positive or it was into the seminal vesicles. Um, we would give radiation just based on the pathology report. There's three big trials that came out uh, over the last two years, mostly in sort of low to intermediate risk disease, to be fair, that showed there is no benefit for adjuvant, meaning immediate radiation, versus waiting until the PSA rises. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some radiation oncologists believe that this probably doesn't apply to high risk disease, and maybe patients with high risk should still get adjuvant. But the reality is, at, at our center, we use ultra sensitive PSA, so we will tell if it's under, you know, 0 0.015. If it's under that threshold they're good. And what I usually tell men is we can talk about adjuvant radiation. Um, but honestly, if you told me there's a 90% chance I'm going to need radiation, I would say, great. That's a 10% chance I don't. And the minute the PSA starts going up, that's the time to do it. The other reason we're tending to wait a little bit these days is uh, we're using a lot of PSMA PET scanning, which is a whole nother conversation again. Yeah. Um, and that, that scan is much more broadly available in the community now than it was even a few months ago. And to get any yield out of the PSMA PET to try to find out where the recurrence is, uh, you really need to wait until the PSA is 0.2. So we almost never give adjuvant. We wait until the PSA rises, but I don't wait that long. You know, We will scan at 0.2 and start treatment around that time. And you, you think every man who gets surgery and has their prostate out, they should have an ultra-sensitive PSA, not a regular PSA? That's controversial and, and not necessarily. Some urologists don't like it. Some patients don't like it because you can have a detectable ultra-sensitive that kind of bounces up and down and causes anxiety. I don't, you know, we do it and I'm very used to it, but there's, I have plenty of colleagues, even in academics that still use 0.1 and it's probably fine. Honestly. Yeah. I'd like to know because by the time it gets to 0.2, I like to see what yeah. it's been doing over the last few months, but you know. No, I mean, that's, that's, that's interesting. So um, I'll, I'll leave you on a, a less serious note. Uh, my last two questions, they were my quiz questions. You're stuck on Alcatraz Island, which is behind you, right? And you can only watch <laughs> one thing on TV. Now, keep in mind that I swam from that island to the shore, by the way, if you want to be impressed. That's a race. I've it was a race. race. I did it once. I'll never do it again. It was the worst <laughs> night of my life. I was did the triathlon or just the swim? I did the triathlon. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's I mean, something. that's a midlife crisis, man. <laughs> um, but I look at that Island and I just have this vitriol toward it because I think, Oh, that was a bad swim. All right. Only one thing on TV and you're stuck on Alcatraz. Are you going to watch the golden state warriors, the San Francisco 49ers, the giants or a Moyed lecture, or you fill in whatever, what would one thing you would, you would watch? I mean, obviously the Moyad lecture, but, but once you're done talking, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go back and forth between the Niners and the, uh, and the doves. <laughs> yeah. I like okay. the Giants too. I'm just less of a baseball guy. The Giants. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. My last question, which was going to be my first one, that leads to your gift that's coming to your house next week. <laughs> Michigan plays Yale or Dartmouth, both your alma maters. They play them in football. <laughs> all right. What would be the final score? See if you can get that right. There's actually. That depends on the year. In, in my era, Dartmouth, we had a future NFL guy as our quarterback, and we had a legitimate football team. Not that we would have gone up against Michigan, but I might have given it a score. Yeah. Uh, these days, I'm sure it's going to be about, you know, 53 to three if we're lucky. Yeah, <laughs> so. no, that's a good guess. But the reality is neither team would show up for the game. So Michigan. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so, but we want you to be proud of one of your alma mater, especially the one that I'm most proud of, because I share that with you. And so I don't know if uh, Alex is still there. This is what's coming to your house. We apologize, but this is the fastest they could Oh, I love it. it. So that's coming it. next week. Your Thank long you. Yale School of Public Health shirt. That's awesome. They sent me. A, they sent me a mask during the pandemic. It was my favorite. It was my favorite uh, kind of random cloth mask. I loved it. No, that's on its Thank way. You. They've already put it in the box. It's just awesome. that they told awesome. us it won't come till next week. So we had to do Thanks this. Thanks so much. So I apologize, but listen. Thanks I for having me on. What'd you say? I said, thanks for having me on. This no, has been a lot no, of fun. Absolutely. I mean, look at, we already did almost an hour and a half and we barely touched the oh. surface, but we got all the tangibles, you know, that people should think yeah. about. And I just really want to thank you for doing this. You know, That's I mean, you pleasure. did it. Total pleasure. We had you, you did it on the fly at the last second. We've been trying to get you back for years. I hope you really do come back sooner because you have a lot of knowledge to give. And you're a classic example of that stupid stereotype where says, oh, all surgeons want to do is cut. But we have a lot of surgeons out there that are running active surveillance protocol yeah, yeah. and and they're doing a lot of non-cutting so yeah. cutting's important but you know you're running one of the largest active surveillance protocols there at ucsf and you're surgeons right yeah. 
this is all it's look it's all about treating prostate cancer from start to finish which is what we do and I, like i said it's what we eat breathe live and sleep um and it's yeah. the right treatment for the right patient i mean that's really what the goal is from from start to finish and all of you watching please watch this video over or if you're having questions about active surveillance you know give uh give dr kuberberg's office a call he's been doing this as long as i've known him and uh I, I will say on that note, by the way, in, in the COVID era, we do Zoom visits all over the country with absolutely no problem. So anybody that wants a formal visit, of course, it's it's very easy to find us. That's a really good point. Hey, listen, uh, I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. And uh, I know good I'll see you, you, right? Good seeing yep. you.